A few years ago, I moved into a new apartment with a co-worker. He was generally a good guy, although he had some questionable habits that aren't relevant to the story. On the day of our move, in, we received an inventory of the apartment, which detailed recent replacements and repairs. The management informed us that the carpets had been replaced just 18 days prior, and the maintenance crew had also installed a new stove and bathtub. It seemed like a stroke of luck for us. As we settled in, we meticulously examined the apartment and marked down any issues. Personally, I tend to be quite thorough in such matters, noting every mark, ding, or scratch. To my dismay, I discovered three small, off-yellow stains on the supposedly new, grayish carpet, one in the living room, one in my room, and another in my roommate's room. We made sure to document these stains with precision and specificity. Once we completed the inventory, we submitted it to the leasing agent, who reviewed it with us and acknowledged its accuracy. Satisfied that we had fulfilled our responsibilities, we proceeded with the move in process. I brought along my pup while my roommate had his cat join us. Fast forward 14 months, I was preparing to move out and live with a couple of other friends. We were getting ready to clean the apartment when, to our surprise, Karen, the leasing agent, showed up for a pre-inspection. At that moment, I was at work, but my girlfriend was present. According to her account, Karen walked into the apartment, glanced down the hallway, muttered something about the carpet, and promptly left. She spent less than a minute inside. Given that we maintained a reasonably clean environment, although we weren't fanatical about it, her comment struck us as odd. We assumed everything would be fine. Little did we know. We completed the move-out process and went our separate ways. However, about three weeks later, I received a bill in the mail demanding $1,400 for carpet replacement and various other cleaning expenses. To be fair, some of the charges were legitimate, as my roommate had been attacked a week or two before we moved out, rendering him unable to contribute to the cleaning efforts. While my girlfriend and I did our best, we anticipated a partial deduction from our $500 deposit, not the full amount plus an additional $1,400. I arranged a meeting with Karen and her supervisor, whom I affectionately refer to as Super Witch, to confront the issue head-on. During the meeting, they brought up the three stains and attributed them to either my dog or my roommate's cat. Moreover, they dismissed the initial inventory we had meticulously filled out on our first day, claiming that it was too detailed to be accurate and that the carpet was still brand new. Naturally, I objected to their baseless assertions and refused to accept responsibility for the charges. However, Super Witch decided to escalate the matter by sending it to collections. Despite my year-long struggle with the collection agency, I made no progress and, to make matters worse, my credit score plummeted from around 750 to 650. Understandably exhausted from my high-stress job and the prolonged battle, I contemplated giving in and paying the amount just to put an end to the ordeal. However, it was at this point that my incredible girlfriend, who deserves the title of the best girlfriend in the world, suggested that I take legal action against them. And so, I took the leap and filed a lawsuit against the apartment complex for $7,500, the maximum amount allowed in small claims court without involving a lawyer, which was beyond my financial means. I had the sheriff's department deliver the lawsuit paperwork to the parent company of the apartment complex, and a court date was set. Nervousness consumed me as I had never dealt with anything like this before. With the little evidence I had, I prepared for the court proceedings. On the day of the hearing, the Honorable Judge Awesome McAweomasas presided over the case. When my turn came, I approached the bench with my evidence, only to realize that the apartment complex was nowhere to be found. Judge Awesome, curious about the significant amount I was claiming, asked for an explanation. I recounted the entire ordeal, presenting the inventory with the apartment complex's signature, which clearly stated that both parties acknowledged the existence of stains on the carpet before my move-in. I expressed my belief that it was unjust for me to pay for the carpet replacement when the stains pre-existed, but I was willing to pay the portion I owed if they would remove the bill from collections. Additionally, I mentioned the toll this situation had taken on my mental health, leading to sick days and the missed workday for the court appearance. 
While I acknowledged that I didn't expect to receive $7,500, I wanted to make a statement and hold them accountable for their unfair treatment. Judge Awesome attentively listened, a smile gradually forming on their face. They responded along the lines of, Well, since the other party isn't present, I will grant you a summary judgment. This means you win, and not only are you exempted from paying for the carpet, but you're also entitled to a full refund of your deposit. Although I wanted to burst into dance right then and there, the court's solemn atmosphere restrained me from doing so. Judge Awesome ruled in my favor ensuring that the bill was expunged from my credit record and instructing the removal of the debt from collections. Eager to share my triumph, I promptly called the apartment complex and informed them that I had sued them and emerged victorious. Superwitch, their representative, attempted to downplay the situation, saying, Oh, well, it was a mix-up and our lawyers forgot to appear, but would you still like to settle your bill? I couldn't help but laugh at her audacity and firmly replied, absolutely not, before hanging up. Initially, they resisted payment, so I sent them a letter with the judge's ruling and warned that I would place a lion on their company if they failed to comply. About a week later, a check arrived in my mailbox. In conclusion, this experience taught me the importance of taking photographs, keeping copies of documents, and not simply paying a bill if I genuinely don't owe it. It is worthwhile to fight for justice in court when the responsibility lies elsewhere. The story begins when my father-in-law called my wife, informing her that he might be dying on December 18. Having recently recovered from COVID and experiencing severe sleep deprivation, he appeared to be in a critical state. Concerned for his well-being, we immediately rushed to his side and took him to the hospital. However, instead of confirming his imminent demise, the medical professional scheduled further appointments to investigate the root cause of his condition. The following day, my father-in-law expressed his desire to stay with us during these medical appointments since our home was closer to the hospital and offered better amenities like heating and air conditioning, which his own house lacked. However, he failed to clarify what he meant by taking care of him, leaving me uncertain whether he wanted us to merely provide a place to stay or to cater to his every need. When questioned, my wife couldn't provide more information as he didn't elaborate on his expectations or the duration of his stay. Despite his wish to attend church, we had to depart immediately due to my wife's work commitments and my own car tire replacement. Reluctantly, we left him behind, promising to return when we were available. Later that day, while waiting for my tire replacement, I received a call from my father-in-law's phone, but to my surprise, it was my 14-year-old sister-in-law on the line requesting our address. Apparently, they were already on their way, and my father-in-law had brought his younger children along without consulting us. This unexpected development added to my frustration as I resided in a two-bedroom apartment that was already stretched for space. Moreover, I had taken my only vacation time for the year, and it felt as if my personal time off had been disregarded in favor of taking care of someone else's children. As a week passed by, my wife continually reminded me not to be mean, but I reached my breaking point due to the constant bickering among the kids. Fed up with the situation, I expressed my firm stance, declaring that if my father-in-law had to be present during my Christmas holiday, I would be taking the kids back to their home on the 24th. I firmly believed that they needed to be with their own family during such an important time. Throughout the packing process, my father-in-law persistently questioned why they had to leave and who had decided to send them back. On Christmas Day, I attempted to spend quality time with my wife, but my father-in-law felt lonely and sought someone to talk to. We had already celebrated Christmas with my family on different dates, as my family typically spent the actual Christmas Day at home. Consequently, I felt as if my vacation and holiday had been hijacked by my father-in-law's presence. As weeks went by with numerous hospital visits, we finally met his primary care doctor, who reviewed his medical history and concluded that his symptoms were indicative of anxiety and depression. However, my father-in-law remained convinced that he was gravely ill, disregarding the professional opinions of multiple doctors. At this point, I had reached my limit. Repeatedly, 
We inquired about his departure plans, but he continuously replied that he didn't know. It was then that we decided to call my mother-in-law, only to discover that he intended to stay with us until at least March. Both my wife and I had reached our breaking points, and we firmly informed him that he had to vacate our premises by January 21st. Despite his attempts to guilt us into allowing him to stay until February, we remained resolute. We needed our lives back. It's important to note that during this time, my father-in-law repeatedly crossed boundaries, invaded our privacy, and became upset when we couldn't alter our plans to accommodate him. As someone who values my alone time, he disregarded this need, insisting that I dine with him for shared conversations, dismissing the importance of my personal space. Additionally, despite my wife informing him about my own struggles with anxiety and depression, he persistently pressured me to open up about my experiences, which made me uncomfortable. I was 18 years old and had been working at a charming bakery shop in my hometown since I was 16. Our town was a close-knit community, where almost everyone knew each other. It was a place filled with sweet old folks walking their dogs and children excitedly collecting stickers from the local library. I had lived here my entire life, and while I was preparing to move for university, it still held a special place in my heart. This story unfolds during the corona pandemic shortly after the initial lockdown in England. Our shop was considered an essential business because we sold staple items like milk, bread, and flour. As a safety precaution, we had to wear masks, and while we couldn't directly tell customers to wear them, we advised them to do so. Since I hadn't returned to college yet, my boss and co-worker asked me to help out a few hours here and there, as one employee was still on furlough. I agreed, as it would give me some extra money. However, Due to low stock from the main bakery that supplied our food and bread, we often had to go next door to the local shop to buy additional supplies like butter and lettuce. On this particular day, we had run out of butter just as the morning rush of builders arrived, eager for their bacon baps. My boss asked me to take a few pounds from the cash register, purchase some butter, and bring back the receipt. I was used to these tasks and didn't mind. I took off my work apron and threw on my jacket to shield myself from the freezing weather, got the butter, and headed back. As I approached the bakery's entrance, a woman stuck her foot out to block my way. I silently hoped she wasn't a Karen, and luckily she wasn't far off. Let's call her Lady L, and me, me, is me. L, ahem. Me, yes, L. It's two customers at a time, and I was here first. Since we wore black trousers and a black button-up shirt for work paired with leggings and trainers for comfort, I can understand her confusion. I didn't look like an employee. Nay, I know it's two people at a time. I'm just trying to... L, I was here first. I tried to go around her again, but she moved closer to the door. My anxiety kicked in, worsened by the pandemic, making me extra cautious about people being near me. To avoid panicking and keep her unmasked self at a distance, I took a step back. My boss hadn't noticed us, as she didn't know I had returned from the shops and was busy serving another customer, a mom with her screaming child, and a builder. At this point, I gave up and swiftly darted into the bakery just as the second customer left. I adjusted my apron just in time to see the lady storm in, ready to start a confrontation. My boss had gone to do paperwork since it was only the two of us and there was a lot to be done. I couldn't help but smile beneath my mask. Me in a sweet tone. Hello, how can I assist you today? The lady stood there momentarily dumbfounded, and as you can guess, she wasn't wearing a mask. Sensing her frustration, I decided to make things even more interesting. Me, boss's name. Did you want me to deliver a customer's bread on my way home from work? My boss responded with a hearty yes, please. I turned back to serve the lady, who left without uttering a word. Despite dealing with difficult customers most of the time, that day turned out to be a good one in retail. I later shared the story with my boss, and we had a good laugh together. She did wonder why I was standing outside with a pack of butter. 